Family, this is your favorite queer radio personality, Anna Deshaun here, and I'm excited to bring you another exclusive interview. And this one is actually really, really special because Travel is special, okay? And if you don't <laughs> know Travel, that's okay, because you're going to get to know them today. All right, Absolutely. they are an award. Period. <laughs> Hello, period with a T. They are an award-winning journalist, okay, critic, podcaster, worked for Out Magazine, let me just go on for a little ages, okay? Out Magazine, the LA Times, okay? You've seen Travel's work on the covers, okay, of such places like Essence, okay? They've written for Teen Vogue, Washington Post, The Esquire, Time Magazine, child. Travel is the business and truly a treasure. We got to meet at the National Gay Lesbian Journalism Association. Just get all of the words mm -hmm. all of in there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, when it was here in Chicago, and I'm so glad we got to meet. Travel. welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So glad to be here. Um, those IRL connections do matter. Shout out to us. Um, and yeah. I guess shout out to NLGJ. I don't know. You know, I'd be wanting to fight them from time to time. <laughs> anyway. Um... <laughs> That's a whole nother show. Listen, and okay. I, and, and I'm glad you got the acronym because, child, I do not, okay? I be like, the, the gays is the gays with the journalism association. Y'all know what you mean. Y'all know what it you is. You know, you already know what it is. And also, Travel is going to get me into the National Association of Black Journalists, out. too. I'm going to work on getting on mm -hmm. NABJ. Uh huh. Um, <laughs> but today, I'm excited to have Travel on because Travel. On top of all the things I just said, and child, I didn't even mention the people that they've interviewed over the years, some of your favorite stars on the planet, period. They are now an author as well. And so today we're here to talk about your very first book, We See Each Other. Come yes. on. Come on, we author. We See Each Other. Yes. We See Each Other, A Black Trans Journey Through TV and Film, out May 9th, available for pre-order wherever you get Slayworthy books, Okay. And where you get bad books, too. That's fine. You know, you can find it everywhere. <laughs> everywhere. And you need to get it. I believe what I really loved, because I did get, like, my own copy, which is really dope as being a media person. I mean, if you've ever thought about being in the media, these are some of the perks. You can kind of get something before everybody mm -hmm. else gets to see it. What I think is really beautiful about the book it's that you're giving this historical context around trans life and media and film and television specifically, also giving people recommendations and this viewing guide that kind of goes through the experience. I got a lot to catch up on, even though I feel like I've seen a lot of gay, mm -hmm. queer stuff in my life. There's still so much I have not seen or heard about. So tell me, why did you want to add this piece of work into the canon of LGBTQ queer? Yeah. Why was this one important for you? That's a great question, and I think the answer really lies in the fact that, you know, there are so many contributions of trans wondrousness that aren't regarded as canonical at all for a variety of reasons, right? Um, some of those are legitimate trans characters, right, that we have seen on screen, largely, you know, poor depictions, stereotypical depictions, depictions seeping in tropes. But even in some of those tropes, right, some of us found representation, some of us felt held and reflected back on screen. And it was important for me to basically assert kind of first and foremost my own personal history of my gender journey and identity formation um, as filtered through a number of these, you know, films and TV shows that we will talk about um, and that I explore in the book. But also hoping that that can be in service of some other Black person or trans person or non-binary person having some sort of reference point for themselves and their own journeys before Pose, before Laverne Cox, before, you know, Chaz Bono, if that's your generation, right? Oftentimes it seems as if our history as trans people, not only in this country, but on this planet, began with Laverne Cox on Orange is the New Black or Chaz Bono. But there's a very long history of existence that we would term and define as trans today, 
right, that happened uh, in life and in culture and in communities across the globe, but also on screen in ways that challenged various conventions at the time in which they, you know, came about. So I wanted to do a book that would have all of that, but you get a whole lot of my own personal story in it. And, you know, it's got a little razzle-dazzle on top uh, because I wanted folks to be able to, you know, have this in this this history, this context for this particular moment of trans visibility that we are, are living through um, and backlash to trans existence that we are living through while also hopefully starting some own conversations within your own individual minds about how you have seen, grappled with, or wrestled with, or not images of trans folks in, in broader culture. And to your point around trans visibility in the media prior to in Orange is the New Black mm -hmm. or coming out and, and everything that that was, so much of that was due to like just safety. Yeah, absolutely. We need to be safe. Like passing absolutely. and like these things were just so critical to folks existence. And so today, when we talk about people being unapologetically themselves out here in the world, and this increased representation has increased the hate that then we are seeing today mm -hmm. with 400 plus, mostly anti-trans, mm -hmm. all anti-LGBTQ bills making their way across the legislatures across this country, and also the banning of books. So mm -hmm. I think what's really so important about your book and so important about anyone who is writing a book about the LGBTQ experience today is that it is so important to create it because there are so many people banning these books now about mm -hmm. our experience and about our life that we have to create more so that folks to. don't forget us. You know, our history has to be written. Otherwise it, it will not be told. And mm -hmm. so I'm just so proud of you for putting it all together and putting yourself in the middle of it. And it not just being a history book. It is not a history book. So that's what it is. It started off as a, as a history book. Uh, that's okay. what I pitched. Uh, and that's, that's <laughs> what they bought. Uh, that's what they bought a history book. It is, they, but it's so much more bought. than that. Exactly. Well, I, in the, yeah. in the course of actually writing the book, it, it changed, right? It was it was meant to be a lot more comprehensive. Like that's what I had pitched and sold. But in the course of writing, I I ultimately was watching a whole lot of like transphobic, anti-trans, very problematic narratives. And I was like, why am I forcing myself to like, you know, re-traumatize myself and unsettle all of these, you know, angsts that I have as a trans person moving through this world. And then that's when I decided to just center myself and my experience um, and the complexities therein a lot more. And I think the result, right, is a book that like, yes, it's a book about trans history and visibility on screen, but like I talk about Medea in this book. I talk about RuPaul and drag in this book. I talk about all these other things that, you know, I think are are related to the conversation of trans visibility, but folks might not necessarily automatically place them because of the complexities of of language and identity. So, you know, I hope hundred percent. I saw uh, Yeah, so and I think what's gonna happen is that people will begin to see themselves in you as mm -hmm. they read the book. And so I'm so glad that you did put yourself in it and that you you followed the gut that said, I have more to say than just the history of this thing and not just mm -hmm. the fact of what this thing is and how it was created, but also how I came to this piece and why yeah. it meant something to me or why it informs all this other work that happened. And so uh, you you talk about Medea and RuPaul. Mm -hmm. and when Flip dressed up as that character mm -hmm. and it was a comedic thing. Mm -hmm. And how, how does that translate when we talk about real trans folks lives yeah. and how um and how folks interact with them in real in life um and how that was set up on television yeah you know the thing that just comes to mind for me and this is it 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 includes philip wilson as geraldine it includes tyler perry as Medea. it includes martin lawrence as shanae and big mama oh it snaps includes Eddie yes Murphy as all the women he's dressed up with and may i add it also includes the Instagram influencer who puts on a wig as a character, right? For comedic purposes. It's all connected. I mean, I hadn't even thought about Martin Lawrence character. Shanae is just, you know, 
Yeah. It's an iconic role that I grew it up with. It absolutely is, right? But when you look at those characters and the ways that those characters are written, the ways that those characters are referred to in those shows, so much of the discourse and the jokes about them is about their body. It's about the ways that these characters that we are supposed to believe are women, right, fail womanhood, right? Because Shanene has a beard or a mustache, because Medea's hands are so big, because insert person here is still showing us, right, in various different ways that they are a, you know, quote unquote man. And those same types of jokes right, that happen in a Medea movie, that happen in, in, on Martin about Shanene, that happen um, in some of the Eddie Murphy projects. Um, those same jokes are the exact same things that we as trans people here in real life, right, when folks are trying to justify the violence that they enact upon us, right? And so for Black folks, right, we need to talk about the ways in which those characters, right, who were and are foundational for so many of our lived experiences as Black folks in this country can also be sites of, you know, trans antagonism for some trans women in films who, similarly to Shanene, might have facial hair or similarly to Medea might be, you know, six foot seven with big hands and big feet. Right. Um, because those markers of identity that are exploited for comedic purposes in those representations and on social media in your favorite uh, IG influencer content creator. And it's no shade to them for the record. It's just a proper contextualization of the work that they are doing. OK, um, mm -hmm. all of that <laughs> um, leads to, in my estimation and opinion and experience, the violence that we as trans people, Black trans people specifically, face and experience. And so I think we should have conversations about that. I'm interested in having complex and nuanced conversations about that because I don't think it is as clean cut or Black and white as many of us might think it is on either side, right, of, of that particular issue. I agree with that. I think lived experience is very complex. I think James Baldwin calls on us to live in the complexity of it Amen. because we, because we are smart enough to be able to take it all in at the same exact time. Absolutely. But we have to be able to create the spaces for people to have those conversations. And so mm -hmm. your book is the beginning of a conversation that I think so many of us need to have about how we have experienced transness specifically really like in the black experience as i you know comb mm -hmm. through the book this is definitely a black <laughs> centered in your black experience and i think that that's so beautiful because oftentimes also within the lgbtq community blackness is not censored and so Absolutely. when i'm looking um through your book and i see your granny right and you talk about mm -hmm. growing up you know and granny being a pastor which mm -hmm. seems all in alignment with so much of our experience and, and what church was and what that meant for how we grew up um, and how we contextualize life. Travel, baby, we started with some <laughs> sanctified hallelujahs around here. <laughs> listen, okay, listen, okay. I was in, I was in church every time the doors swung open. I was there, okay. Uh, that is the foundation of my experience. Um, and who I am, right, beyond my kind of media consumption and media criticism, as I write in the book, you know, I learned so much in church, most present of which for this conversation is how to perform gender um, in, in church, mm -hmm. right? Um, we all, we all, we all know, well, let me not speak on everybody's experience, but my grandmother was one of... Um, you know, the women in her generation who, when she felt called to ministry, the church that she grew, that she came to God in, um, didn't allow women in the pulpit. And so her forming her own church, God's Tabernacle of Prayer, Church of Christian Fellowship, she started in her living room with her eight kids. And that was radical at that time, right? For a woman to be preaching, let alone starting her own church. 
And that is the stock from which I come. And even though there was and is a lot of stuff right there uh-huh. okay. to grapple with. That's you know, a word. The, the complexities, the trauma, mm-hmm. the, 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 hurt. the violence right Mm -hmm. um that happened then in my own experience and that is happening now in black churches and churches that aren't black across this country right Mm -hmm. toward lgbtq people and particularly trans and non-binary folks so much about who i am and how i see the world grows out of that um both as an example of 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 those spaces and all also as um something that is in a lot of ways the antithesis of what one might think of when you think of those spaces. And it was important for me to to include her and include the bit about learning gender in church in this conversation about transness and trans visibility because what would my life be like if I was reared in a religion that made space for transness? If I was raised in a church house, right, that explicitly welcomed us into the fold as the divine beings that we are, right? I hope that, you know, that little slither of the book connects with somebody to start having the conversations for themselves and trying to figure out why, you know, your pastor won't marry LGBTQ people. But we still show up in tithe. Let, but we still show up in tithe. We still, you know, directing the choir. We're st- we're there. <laughs> we're present. We're there. You know, we always have been. We always will be. Right. Um. I often say that, like, you know, the actual secret sauce of the black church is actually black queerness, but nobody wants to talk about it. Right. We all nobody, not. <laughs> nobody wants to talk about the black gay men. Right. Who undergird so much of what we understand to be gospel music today? Mm-hmm. We don't want to talk. Mm-hmm. We don't want. We don't want to talk about it, right? Um, and it's because, mm-hmm. as you mentioned earlier, in many of the, the, many of those generations, right, those foundational generations for most of us, many folks could not be out. They mm. were closeted or discreet or whatever language you want to come up with as a means of survival and navigating those particular spaces. And so it's no shot, right, on them as individuals. All of the blame is on the institution that forced them to have to hide. Um, so, yeah, it was important for me to include that bit in the book because it, 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 is a, it, is, it is another area in which we as Black people should be interrogating how the most marginalized within our communities, uh, which in my estimation includes trans people, can find a home in this space that is supposed to be, you know, um, a, a place of solace for, for, in their eyes, all of us. Yes, that's what they say. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we talk about when you mentioned about the institutions and the silence that was so necessary for survival. You mentioned so many people in this book that have helped shape your mm-hmm. journey in TV and film. And that's how this history is told. And one this OK, there's a few that stood out to me, but I definitely want to start with Monica Roberts. Yes, because yes, Monica Roberts. Monica Roberts. Gee, I mean, we, we should just start with that mm-hmm. because that's exactly who she was. And her reporting about trans life, the violence, the good, all of it with her blog is so reminiscent to me of what an Ida B. Wells was doing Absolutely. in documenting, you know, the lynchings that were happening to black people. And someone had to tell the story. And our modern day Ida to me is Monica Roberts with her work because no one was doing it before her. So mm-hmm. for me, that's who she is. But how did she influence your work as the journalist that you are today? Yeah, I mean, I would say very similarly, you know, Monica was a trailblazer and it's kind of interesting to to see someone blazing the trail as as they're blazing blazing the trail and then also to, you know, be going through my own identity formations as I was as I was discovering more about her and her work and the type of journalist I wanted to be. She 
was a possibility model for me in terms of, you you know, this whole thing about objectivity in our industry and, you know, the ways that people feel as if we as journalists should, should carry ourselves. Um, and so much about who I am is at odds with that idea. And I was able to look at Monica Roberts doing the work that she was doing and be like, actually, I can be a person who, you know, openly and unapologetically identifies as a Black trans person, Black non-binary person of trans experience, who is a journalist and who is bringing that journalistic rigor to the work that we do, both in terms of our, you know, the reporting um, and the storytelling, but also in terms of, like, holding various institutions accountable, right, for their bullshit. Um, Mm -hmm. and Monica Roberts showed me and was showing all of us that long before I even took journalism seriously, I stumbled on Transgrio while I was at Morehouse, um, and was just like, oh, wow, like this, this is a different space. Like I have, I haven't really heard much from black trans people, let alone black trans women. And she's doing this on her site but she's also holding accountable the broader news media, right? Who is misgendering trans people in their life and their death, right? She's holding mm-hmm. accountable legislative officials. It was, it was just, it was, it was um, eye opening for me as I was particularly making my way through the Los Angeles Times to see a black trans woman speaking truth to power, as they say, and holding the industry accountable and really being a one woman band, right? In terms of the type of work that she was doing. And so it was important for me to also talk to her, talk about her in this book, because the type of story that you get in this book is, it is a story ultimately of a black trans journalist who has covered the last decade of trans visibility in my reporting. And so while visibility can always be and will always be right about what we see on screen, visibility is also about who we see in real life and the possibilities that, you know, real people can unlock in us. And Monica Roberts was one of those people and and she deserved to to be mentioned and she will always deserve to be mentioned. I br- any chance I get to bring up Monica Roberts, I do. I know that's right. I know that's right. Because if we don't speak her name, who will? That so part. it is It is so our responsibility to make sure that we continue to amplify all the work that, that she was doing, all the sacrifice. Absolutely. You know, I believe folks think and have this idea about what media is and how much you make and what you... Mm-hmm. And like, <laughs> child, mm-hmm. child. Okay, don't get it twisted, okay? <laughs> Journalists don't make no money, okay? Listen, uh, okay? Let me not digress into this. <laughs> <laughs> Andre Leon Talley, how was yes. that experience? Andre Leon Talley, I first came to know his brilliance on America's Next Top Model. Um, that was my entryway. And then discovered soon after that, oh, this man is actually hot shit. Like, he's not just entertaining on TV. He actually was is like a super power player and like legendary and trailblazing in his own right. And it was him for me. It was him and uh, and Miss J Alexander on America's Next Top Model that were like early possibility models for me. And I had the chance to interview Andre a couple times. Um, actually, the first one being well, this was around the time of his film The Gospel According to Andre. I was working at the LA Times interviewed him. It was great. I talk about it in the book a bit and had the chance to interview him, I think two or three other times after that first time. And even in that first meeting, he, he spoke words and life into me. My, my identity was all over the place at that time, but he, he saw a bit of himself in me and the work that I was trying to do. And it, it, It was impactful enough for him to write about in his own book, The Chiffon Trenches, uh, page 262, in case you were wondering. Uh, Which page? (laughs) 262, you say? 262, in case case you were wondering. Yeah. And and so it's just, he always has a a soft space um, in in my heart. And I, you know, was recently able, you know, they were auctioning off 
some of his belongings. Oh, that's right. Wait, did um, you get something? I was able to secure something. I had to rob Peter to pay Paul to get it. <laughs> but I did. I, I got one of his caftans and... Uh, it's 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 literally just laying on my couch because I don't know what to do with it. I'm like, do I hang it up as an art piece? Like, do I do I get it tailored and try to wear it? Like, what do you do? What do you do? I think I'm gonna like get a mannequin and like put it in the corner of my office as like just like an art piece or something. I don't know, but okay. uh, soft spot for Andre Leon Talley forever. Forever, I think I think an art piece is a beautiful way. It's sort of like his spirit will always be there. Right. And yeah, and I think him meeting you is probably a really full circle moment for him to see himself in someone else. He paved the way for so many yeah. of us, right? Like and, so and many. We yeah. all, as we should always treat all of our possibility models as the complex beings and individuals that they are. And so I use this opportunity to note that I know some people feel like he did not do enough for black folks in fashion and in journalism. And I would agree with you. And yet many of us exist today in the ways that we exist today because of his example and because of what he did. And we can't dismiss that as well. It is guaranteed that no one, mm -hmm. <laughs> absolutely mm -hmm. no one absolutely. is going to be the ideal for everybody, but the existence of them sometimes is enough to Absolutely. show that it is possible and that we are brilliant. And I think he, I love what you say is possibility models. I think that's what they are. 150%. Now, one person who has their own chapter in your book is yes. Miss Laverne Cox. So, mm -hmm. I mean, Laverne Cox on Orange is a New Black is a moment. And to think that it's been a decade since that, Mm -hmm. came out is really hard to wrap your mind around but talk about barrier breaking glass ceiling shattering it was a whole moment it was a it whole was. moment it was both for me personally and in broader culture right like because of Orange is New Black, because of Laverne on Orange is New Black, right? That's how we get to that Time magazine cover in which they, you know, dubbed the moment the transgender tipping point, right? Is that um, what they dubbed it? That's what they called it, the transgender tipping oh, point. Okay. And, <laughs> and it was supposed to signal, right, this massive shift. And there was a shift of sorts right at that this was like 20 2014 i think is when the uh 2013 2014 is when the the article came out time magazine article around the same time you know uh uh transparent was you know doing what it did as well but it was it was supposed Laverne Cox was supposed to signal, you know, this massive shift. And I think now we can look back at the last 10 years or so and see that, you know, we've had some some glimmers of hope and some inroads and some positivity along the way. But perhaps we're not as far along as as folks would like to make us believe. We're not as 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 visible right as people would like to believe which they use as justification for all this anti-trans legislation that we've already discussed but laverne was pivotal i think in this broader conversation about trans visibility because she was not, one she was black mm -hmm. and so many of the trans folks that might have popped up in most folks's you know understandings of pop culture and media diets at that time were not black right mm -hmm. and two she whereas jeffrey tambor and eddie redmayne and uh jared leto were able to take off the wig and the makeup and the nails you know once the character was done she did not and so that that, necess that necessarily changed the conversation, right? Because now she's not just speaking about a character um, in this fictitious world, right? She's speaking about not only her lived experience, but the experiences of, of the, the folks that she came to represent. And so, yeah, she, she, need, she needed her own chapter because of that alone. 
Um, and then beyond that, because of what the ways that she has, like, you know, in ways that she does not even know, factored into my own personal becoming and journalistic journey. Su super, su super pivotal. And, and the fact that she did all of this and shouldered all of this pressure and shouldered all of this, you know, representation that was thrust on her. And she, she did it with as much grace as anyone could. And I know we are always asking trans people and black people and folks from marginalized communities to be gracious to the folks who are inflicting harm on us, even when those folks look like us and live like us and come from our same communities. And I talk a little bit about that in the book and how that should not be the expectation of these folks. And yet still, the fact that she did it, has done it, is continuing to do it, deserves recognition. 150%. I could not agree more. I think her impact on entertainment, her being on red carpets, mm -hmm. all of it, all every move she makes matters. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it opens a door. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe not even a door at that moment, maybe a window. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to open an opportunity for someone because they're going to look and see her doing it. And know that it's possible for someone else who also identifies Absolutely. on the trans spectrum as someone else who can do it. And I think that in and of itself, I agree. A whole chapter, a hundred, a hundred percent. And 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 I, I, we also have to talk about trans masculinity because mm. oftentimes trans experience is centered around the film experience mm -hmm. and not often at all for so a myriad of reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, so many trans men live stealth. Mm -hmm. um, so many do not live out, but mm -hmm. they are amongst us always. Mm -hmm. And there is something to be said about that. And you spent a little bit of time in your book talking about trans masculinity and just how you've yeah. seen it, you know, represent itself. Yeah. You know, the majority of the, the, people that I focus on in the book and the majority of the people that we often focus on in our broader discourse about trans visibility um, are trans women, to be specific. And we don't talk about trans men or trans masculine people. We, we have glimmers, again, in, in the reality TV world. You know, shout out to Zeke Smith from Survivor. Um, he was outed on, on Survivor. Shout out to mm -hmm. Chaz Bono, as we already mentioned. Alexis Arquette, as somebody who has traversed gender in multiple ways, also comes to mind. Um, um, the guy that's on Lone Star, Lone Star 911? Brian Michael Smith, Smith. yep. Um, Brian Michael Lone Smith, Star, um, who got his like main, I guess I, I don't want to say mainstream start, but like before Lone Star, which he made history as the first black trans man to have a series regular role with that particular TV show. He was on Queen Sugar. Um, and I, I like noting that this black ass show, Queen Sugar, was the the jumping off point. He actually used his role in Queen Sugar to come out as trans to the industry after already playing a number of cis roles, you know, on various shows prior to that. Anyway, it was important to hype to to put a focus, particularly on the narratives of and experiences of uh, and representations of trans men and trans masculine people for that very reason. Our discourse around trans visibility, we should always strive to make it as as expansive as possible because our our mere existences are expansive. And when we don't also talk about the need for greater representation of trans men and trans masculine people, we we ignore and dismiss and erase the very particularity, right, of their experiences, which are different than our experiences as trans women and femmes. The conversations that we have to have around identity, around misogyny, around sexism, around homophobia and transphobia are different because of the particular special space that, that trans men and trans masculine people move through the world in. And this was something that I was not um, always thinking of and considering. I'll save it for the people to read the book to figure out exactly Come what on. I'm saying here. Um, but it wasn't yes. always something that I thought about. And a lot of my discourse, a lot of my work over the years 
hyper focused on trans women and femmes. And so I, I wanted to be sure to surface some of the concerns that I've heard from them and some of the, the trans men and trans masculine people who have also been pivotal in, you know, this journey of visibility that we have gone through as a community on screen. Facts. And I'm so glad that you did. I think it's such an important topic. And so I'm glad that they are a part of this narrative too. And I mean, there's also this, this section that you call um, trans Sisters, trans sisters, trans sisters, and if you get the idea of family, trans and ancestors, mm -hmm. and this portion where you are giving flowers to those folks who many people probably do not know. Yeah, I think it's absolutely beautiful what you've done there. Tell me why. Yeah. Tell me why trans sisters. Well, you know, so, so I'll I'll be I'll be frank and say that. You know, when when you're when you're doing a book, there are certain numbers of pages that you have to hit just in terms of like the actual printing. Um, and so after I had written everything that I had written, we had a few pages left um, and I didn't want blank pages. I wanted to do something with them. And one of the th issues that I kept having was that there were so many trans folks who have contributed to broader pop culture who I couldn't mention because they either didn't fit into, you know, the general narrative that I was creating, or maybe they weren't actors or actresses, right? And so they wouldn't have factored into a film and TV dis discussion. I decided ultimately to like, oh, what if I just use this as an opportunity to continue, continue the potential education, right, for folks about trans the ways that transness has shown up in our broader pop culture um before today and so i use that section to highlight people like ajita wilson who was an adult film star um back in the day who was a jet beauty of the week mind you a black trans woman mm -hmm. as a jet beauty of the week uh um, come on you know i highlight people like candy darling hollywood lawn um, um wilma broadnax um Names that we should all know, but we many of us don't. Um, again, just to drive home even more that trans people have always been here and we have always made the world better. You just did not know that we were there. Yeah. yeah. But we've been here. But we've been here. We've been here and we ain't we, going nowhere. We've been here. Never. Never. Now nowhere. we see each other. What does that mean? Why? Why is the book called "We See Each Other"? <laughs> <laughs> I want it to be clear. So I should say the, "We See Each Other" is not the title that I sold the book as. So if folks are like looking up the history of this book, it'll look like the book dropped out of the sky because when it was announced. The, the title of the book was Seen, S-E-E-N, colon, Trans Lives on Screen. That's what I sold the, the title as. Knowing that I had always changed, I would always change it. But to be quite honest, I went with the title for the proposal phase that I thought would be easily understood by the people potentially buying the book. But I always knew I would change it. And ultimately, I wanted the title to speak to the audience that is center of mind for me as I write, which is not to say folks who fall outside that audience can't get anything from the book. Um, but I wanted to be clear that even as everybody else gets to, you know, peek in and consume and also grapple with the things that I bring up, I'm writing for black folks. I'm writing for trans folks. I'm writing for queer folks who live, love and exist like me. So we see each other because we see each other, you know? Yes, we do. Um, I also really like the idea of, because, you know, we see each other and, you know, everybody, many people, I should say, think now of, of um, Candy and Nene um, from the Housewives mm. of Atlanta and, and, and that oh. meme. Um, yes. And, and I, I wanted something that Black people would say a particular way because they understood it a particular way, but that, you know, the rest of y'all, you know, you can see we see each other and it's fine, but but the people who know, know, right? 
Um, and so that's, that, that's another thing that I was very excited to to be able to do. But really, it was about making sure that like I'm speaking to and with black trans folks um, about the types of experiences that we have had. Um, and the rest of you all get to to listen in on it. Um, but it's not necessarily written with them and those particulars in mind. So you know, you know, you're not gonna you're not gonna get a comprehensive, you know, history. You gonna you gonna get the things that that I wanted to fucking talk about. <laughs> Period. Because it's my book. Okay. My book. And you can do that. And and for everybody, the whole point of this whole interview is one, you need to go get the book. And so but when we drop this, it's gonna be available for pre order. And then it's available everywhere. Is it May 9th? May 9th. Yes. May 9th. But you can pre-order the book now. And pre-orders are so incredibly important. So go wherever you go to get your books. Hit the pre-order button. It's, just know it's important. Go do it. Go support Travel because Travel is here for us because we see each other. Okay. We see each other. Period. <laughs> period. Thank you so much, Travel, for being here. Thank you for your work. You know, the last decade, but even before then was all leading you up to this moment. And you're doing something that's bigger than yourself with this work. And it'll live on way past you. Right. And, th and this is what we're here to do is to be a vessel for the work that we're called to do. And you're living that you're in living embodiment of that. So thank you. Thank, thank you for you. seeing us. Um, I'm Thanks also, for coming I have, on. I have I have a tendency of taking over people's show at the end because I believe in also giving you your flowers. You know, I want to, you know, the work that you are doing with The Cube, with Queer News, I I learned of it when we met in Chicago um, last year and I have been a supporter from afar and, and the community that you are building with the work that you are doing, the narratives that you are putting out there with the, the HIV in the South uh, podcast as well. I'd be listening to yeah. that as well. Um, I just want to say that like you deserve all of the kudos that you are getting that award that you won a couple months ago. Shout out to you. You absolutely deserve it. The work that you put in is necessary as well. And I'm grateful for you too. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. And it means a lot coming from you because you know the grind that My is Lord today. <laughs> My Lord today. the world that has called us to do work. Okay. <laughs> Oh, family go today. get the book <laughs> you know what I'm saying <laughs> go do your pre-order and then there's an audio book coming too so just get ready to get that as well we see each other bye Travel. thank you so much and family stay close you already know you locked in this is Queer News Queer News done right latest <laughs>